Hi guys, Jonathan with Farmer's Friend, and today I'm here on the beautiful Whidbey Island with Steven at Foxtail Farms, and we're gonna be giving you guys a tour. My name is Steven, uh, this is Foxtail Farm. We are uh, in Washington State in the little town of Freeland, Washington, which is on Whidbey Island. Uh, yeah, we're just to the northwest of Seattle, and we are a 10-acre diversified vegetable and cut flower farm. This is our eighth year of production. I am originally from North Carolina and had the good fortune to be able to do an organic farming program in 2012, which was located on the island and loved it so much that decided to move out here permanently. So. In 2014, we moved out here and uh, bought this beautiful property and have been in production ever since 2016. And yeah, we love it. And we're, we're so grateful to be in this beautiful place with yeah. this beautiful uh, community that has accepted us with open arms for the very beginning. So yeah, we're, That's we're, cool. we're lucky. Well, it's amazing to see all that you guys have accomplished um, in just the last, what, six, seven years, I guess, that you've been farming. So we're excited to be able to show you guys the operation and we're going to start just right here behind us with some of the greenhouses or caterpillar tunnels you have set up and so show us uh show us around yeah so we have eight caterpillar tunnels here which we have modified to be 125 foot long so we these eight tunnels represent 10 actual 100 foot kits yeah and we sacrificed two of them to get the extra length out of them. So uh, they're also 16 foot wide units and which makes it so that we have exactly 2000 square feet of growing space. And all of them, this tunnel right here is, we call it our propagation house and we'll go in and take a tour. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, we've had these kits for a long time and they've, they've served us well. So that's great. And then on the end walls, you've just done a simple, this is not a kit that we offer, but four by four posts in concrete all the way up to the peak and then a, and a sliding door and you did the same door on both ends right? yep, the yeah the same door on both both ends this is the prop house we do have a roll-up side on one side uh we this the we have nine foot of of headroom all of these are in ground posts when we originally bought them they were just the standard kit and we modified them to put them on ground posts that we bought from you guys and so they're permanent these don't move we will take the plastic off of some of them sometimes if we need to, okay. but the plastic lives on this one year round all the time. And when the time comes to replace it, we'll do that. Yeah, cool. So I wanted to show everybody um, this germination pod you have inside. This is kind of unique, so. So we, we had some extra bows left over from purchases over the years. And we wanted to make a little tunnel inside of the tunnel to take advantage of some passive solar heating in the early part of the season without having to use too much electricity. So we use this primarily starting in January when we start our tomatoes and onions and things like that. We'll start them on the germination mats. As soon as they pop, we'll put them in here and they'll live in here where it's a little bit warmer. Uh, when we have sunny days, it'll get up to 75, 80 degrees in there, no problem in January. Um, so yeah, we just had this extra stuff and wanted to, to be able to use it in, a, in an affordable way. So we just, we had some pieces and parts laying around and put this together and we, we use the racks to get some vertical space out of there and there are grow lights in there. So we'll plug the grow lights on in, yeah. in January and February when we don't have a lot of daylight and that gets things off to a really good fast start. So we can yeah. get a head start on the season. That's great. So you get, the, the double layer of plastic, so you additional layer inside of the tunnel, yeah. and you get significant amount of additional heat in there. For sure, it'll be 20, 25 degrees warmer in there than it will be out here, particularly on a sunny day. So yeah, yeah if it's 40 degrees outside, it'll be 65 in there, no, no problem at all. And that'll make sure that the little baby seedlings don't, don't suffer and they can just continue growing until it's time to either pot them up or put them in the field in, in March. Yeah, okay, cool. That's awesome. Do you grow much artichoke? Is that just kind of for your own use? Well, we've tried to perennialize them and we have replanted this patch two or three times. It's wet here in the winter time, so some of them die off. Okay. These are the ones that made it through the winter, but we do have a new section where we planted about 600 more. Oh, wow. Um, 
in a, in a drier part of the field that we're hoping we can make perennials so that we don't have to keep replanting them. But uh, we harvest these for sales, but we don't get a ton of yield yeah. out of them. So we'll eat them and we'll harvest them for the farm stand and they go pretty quickly. So okay. it's just a nice little added thing that we have. Let's talk about the sweet potato patch. You got, um, did you say it was 3,000 yeah. slips? So I'm from North Carolina. North Carolina is the biggest sweet potato growing state in the country. So really? I, I, I love them. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we don't get particularly hot here in the Northwest. And so sweet potatoes will grow, but you have to do some extra things just to make sure you get a good okay. crop out of them. So we grow these all in landscape fabric. This is about a third of an acre. Uh, and they're planted in rows a foot apart, uh, in row. And then, yeah, there's 30 beds from, from here to there. And we cover them with frost cloth. We keep that on the entire time they're growing to trap as much heat as possible. Mm -hmm. So particularly so that it stays as warm as possible overnight, because we will still get down into the 50s even in the middle of the summer. So just to make sure that the growth stage never stops and it's always doing something underground. Um, and yeah, we, we overhead water them when, when they need it. And in September, late September, early October, we will harvest them and yeah, try to get a couple pounds per plant out of it so that we can get six or 7,000 pounds worth of sweet potatoes. And we get a good premium price for those because nobody else does it around here. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of work, a lot of effort. I don't grow my own slips. I, we have a farm back in North Carolina that does it for us and they ship them out to us at the end of May and we plant them and we try to get them in the ground as soon as possible so that we can take as much advantage of the, the summer months as possible because yesterday was the summer solstice as we're filming this. Mm -hmm. and so the days will only be getting shorter from here on out. Yeah. Uh, so we want to try to take as much advantage of the sun as possible so that they, they, they grow. We don't want them massive, but we do want them nice medium size. and. People love them and we get a good price for them. So yeah, it's, it's great. worth the effort for sure. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So this is the primary tomato or you have, how many tunnels do you have in tomatoes? We've, we've got three, two and a half. Three. Okay. Uh, yeah, each tunnel has 460 tomatoes in there. We have four rows and they're a foot apart. So we really try to pack them in there. Uh, these are all indeterminate varieties. Uh, and we use the clipper system that we got from you guys, which we, we love. Um, what were you doing before Clipper? Before we were using the tomahawk system okay, and that was fine. And before that, we were just using baling twine like a lot of people use. Yep. So each iteration has been a little bit better than the one before. And mm -hmm. this one is by far the best. We all love it. It, it makes uh, trellising them throughout the season so much easier. You move one clip, move it up above the other one and it's good. And we love how neat and clean and straight it keeps everything and it, it it's much sturdier. So if we get a little bit of a breeze, they're not flopping around so much. And uh, yeah, we love them. It's a bit of an, an investment up front with the yeah. cost, but yeah. you, you, we, we consider it an investment. So it's something that we, we've paid for it and we'll have it forever as long as we take care of them. So yeah, um, yeah it, it hurts a little bit up front, but we hope to have them for decades and use them every year. And they're yeah. they're just a really, really cool, uh, well-engineered system that, that's well-built. And we, yeah, we like them a lot. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think it's also neat to see four rows of tomatoes trellised off of a caterpillar tunnel. I think at this point, a lot of people realize that these structures are plenty strong enough to be doing overhead trellising. But when we first started selling them, we had a lot of people questioning that and, and uh, asking if it was strong enough yeah. like yeah it's strong enough and that it but yeah you've got a lot of tomatoes hanging off the structure i mean in in august when they're heavy with fruit and the you know the big one pound slicers and there's hundreds of them at mm -hmm. a time i've never worried about the structure collapsing sometimes the the wire will snap or whatever oh, really? but it, it's happened and it, it's yeah. it the whole thing won't fall but uh if that happens, you know, yeah. we can deal with that. But and you're yeah. just using like a fencing That's wire. That's all it is, yeah. yeah. And we just tension them and uh, keep enough pressure on them to be able to keep mm -hmm. everything nice and straight. And if we have to adjust it, we just take the adjustable wrench and tighten it up a little bit. I'm surprised that that would have broken, but um, what we sell for our trellising is, is a stainless steel woven cable, mm -hmm. which probably is does have a stronger for uh, sure. weight rating than that wire. Yeah, I, I've never worried about the tunnel 
collapsing. We have nine feet of headspace in the center. So we try to put the slicers on the edges because they don't get quite as tall as mm -hmm. the, the cherries. And we do double leaders on the slicers. So each plant has, you know, they're bearing two sets of fruit or whatever. So we have two clippers on each one. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, we, we have six foot of clearance over here. And yeah, we've never had any issues. Yeah. With it. It's been really good. And tomatoes love the tunnels because you, you're able to keep the water off the plant and they get that heat and just drip irrigate, which is, I see what you have that you're getting set up here. Yeah, we haven't had to water yet. So okay. they've gotten this far without any supplemental That's water. So That's amazing. Yeah, we, uh, obviously everybody wants to get to market first with everything. So uh, we start the tomatoes in January and here it is, we're mid to late June and we haven't harvested anything off of them yet. So uh, we've got a lot of time and effort and energy and money invested in these. So we want to take care of them as best we can so that by the time we start harvesting them, we can uh, benefit from all that work we've put into yeah. them beforehand. So having the tunnels, having them protected from the rain because we still, we will get cool and wet and I can protect them in here and I'll keep it a little bit more comfortable for them too. So that, yeah, yeah. They, they continue growing, so yeah. So for your climate here, would these, are these considered early? Like would, do you have other farms around here that are not gonna be, um, to market as early as you guys? Yeah, I think so. I, I think if you can have tomatoes here uh, in our context, anytime in June, you're considered early. Okay. And so most people will have them mid-July, late July, and then you have them clear through October. We don't have necessarily a long enough growing season where you could do successions of tomatoes. Okay. So we try to get them in the ground as early as we can so that they can set their roots and start doing their thing or whatever. And then yeah, by the time the end of June rolls around, we want to have them at market again to be first at market as much as we can to be able to take advantage of that before everybody else has them. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it's always better, in my opinion, to have things earlier than later. And yeah. we, we live in a place where people are very seasonally, I don't know, cuisine conscious people. So yeah. they want to eat with the seasons. And by the time it starts getting cooler again at the end of September, October, people taste and what they're eating has changed so we by the time october rolls around we're kind of done with these and it looks bad they kind of disease starts to set in or whatever yeah. so you know we're done and people are ready to eat brussels sprouts and winter squash then so yeah. we we take advantage of it as much as we can until people are tired of them and we're tired of them too so <laughs> yeah we'll move on to the next thing yeah, yeah. that's great well it's neat to see uh, all that clipper set up so in here we have uh these are watermelons. Yeah, I was telling you earlier, I don't think I've ever seen watermelons in a caterpillar tunnel. I think for most people who will watch this will think we've, we've lost our mind a little bit, but um, the math works. We can pencil it out. Uh, we like this variety. It's a variety called Blacktail Mountain. I, I think it's pretty well adapted for this latitude. We're at the 48th parallel just above it. So we're pretty high. We have long-ish days uh, or whatever, and this you know, again, we don't get super hot. So mm -hmm. our goal is to always try to have watermelons before Labor Day. We live in a very seasonal place where it's a tourist destination during the summer months. Yeah. And we do a farmer's market on Saturday, just down the road. And so we want to, again, take advantage of the, the bulk in population while they're here before mm -hmm. school starts back. And everybody loves watermelons, I do yeah. too. You can definitely grow watermelons outside. Uh, but we probably wouldn't get a harvest until mid-September. And by then there's fewer and fewer people here every weekend. So mm -hmm. we try to get them in one of these things, let them do their things. We'll keep the sides and most, and the doors closed most of the time just to try to cook it in here. And as long as everything is getting pollinated, uh, we feel good about it. We'll water as needed. And uh, in another couple of weeks, you won't even be able to see the, the landscape fabric. Again, we use a lot of fabric so that we don't have to worry about the weeds and it holds moisture and just does what it, uh, it's just something else that we don't have to, to worry yeah. about. So we've, we've made that investment up front. And you can see not every hole is filled, but we use this fabric for any and everything if we have to. So yeah. this is just what we had laying around and this is what got put in the watermelon house. This year. How many plants do you have in here, did you say? There's 350 plants. 350. And if we can get three or four watermelons off of each one, yeah, I mean, this tunnel will make 10 grand or whatever. We, yeah. we can get eight bucks. Uh, per watermelon off of it. So as long yeah. as we have a good crop, yeah, the, it pencils out. It works for us, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the things that's different, well, it's, I mean, it's different in every 
uh, geographic area, but you have pretty, you're able to demand pretty high prices for your stuff, it sounds like. Yeah, um, yeah, we're fortunate. We live in an area where we're right, right next to Seattle. So yeah. it, Microsoft is there, Boeing is there, Amazon mm -hmm. is there. So there's, it's probably an upper middle class uh, income yeah. level. And of course we live on an island, so everything on the island, it, it takes a little more effort. It, costs, it takes a little bit more money to be able to do things. Mm -hmm. And we work hard at this, so we want to make sure that we're paying ourselves well so that you know, I can pay the mortgage and I can pay the staff a fair wage as much as I can afford to pay them. So yeah, if we can get a premium for something and yeah. as long as I don't feel like I'm taking advantage of people, uh, that's what we try to do. And we're, we've been lucky that that's been the case and we don't have too many people balk at what we're, we're doing. So yeah, we're just gonna keep at it as long as we can. That's great. <clears throat> This is our winter squash block. This is the first time we've used this field. Uh, we planted these about three weeks ago. And so they're still adjusting to life a little bit, uh, but they seem to be doing well. And it's red curry, delicata, butternut. So there's some pumpkins splashed in there too, uh, whatever. And as the years have gone by, we've tried to do more storage crops to give us some cash flow over the winter season and stuff yep. like that when things have slowed down and things like that so this is our flower block uh it's a half acre flower field and we've got two traditional uh caterpillars in here emily is the person that handles all of our flower production this is her full-time gig and she does a really good job at it with her mom helps her do all this stuff so okay. They manage all of this and we overwinter a lot of things in the two tunnels, the ranunculus and anemones and daffodils and things like that that overwinter so that we can get some early season yeah. flowers. We always want to try to get things by Valentine's Day, but we haven't been able to okay. crack that nut yet, but we're, we're going to get there at some point in time. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Early season flowers are a pretty easy sell. Pe people are coming out of the darkness of the season and they mm -hmm. want some some bright colors and everything in their life. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. Um, what percentage of your revenue comes from flowers? Do you know that? I don't, I don't know that. We, we have the business set up separately, basically. Okay. Uh, Foxtel sells everything retail. So Emily makes us bouquets and flower bunches for the farmer's market, the farm stand, and we have a really thriving local food hub. Okay. And then she handles all of the bulk sales um, events, weddings. We have a big wedding this weekend that she's doing. So she handles all of that. So we try to keep all of that separate. So the numbers don't quite, okay. uh, work out the way I can just give you a, a clear number, but, uh, this is her deal. Okay. She has a degree in horticulture and she loves flowers. Her, her whole family loves flowers and we just kind of leave them alone. And if they need a hand with something, then, you know, she, yeah. she'll call us in, but for the most part, she handles all this stuff. And that's cool. We we've always dabbled in flowers, but never taken it too seriously because the veggies sort of always suck the oxygen out of the room more or less. And she wanted to take this on as a project and we had the space to be able to do it. And yeah, it's been a, a net positive for us overall. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's been something that, I've seen more and more farms growing flowers and finding a real benefit in the additional revenue they can generate from that. I think the first place I really started thinking about it was one time, one year I was visiting Elliot Coleman's farm and he said they were making more money off of flowers than they were on tomatoes, yeah. which tomatoes is oftentimes a big cash crop for small farms. And so that was like, wow, really? So then I've seen more and more people starting to do flowers and making good money off of it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been, it's, it's been good. Uh, yeah. we, again, we, we live in a, in sort of a tourist destination. So a lot of people get married here over the summer okay. and people will spend money on flowers. Oh yeah. Man. It's, it's, it's like, one thing that people don't argue about the price no, very much. You it's know, crazy. It's, and it feels like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking too much for this and like, okay, that's fine. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh yeah we're still figuring everything out but so far it's been uh, uh, positive so 50 percent of your sales you said come from the farm off the farm sales and we're gonna a little bit later be able to show people the farm stand you have but tell us a little bit about the new plans you have here for this new facility so this is 
in at the end of 2019 we knew we were outgrowing the our current farm stand which is it's only 140 square foot uh and then obviously 2020 happened and with the pandemic everything sort of uh we didn't know what was happening or whatever but yeah. uh we knew that we had outgrown the farm stand and we wanted to try to utilize selling from the farm as much as we could so at the beginning of 21 we decided that we'd build this structure we live on a pretty busy road it's a county road but we have a lot of cars that go by and uh, we were always worried that people wouldn't turn off the main road to turn into our driveway where the farm stand is that hasn't been the case people will make the turn but we feel like with having so much road frontage and being sort of forward facing now that people will see it and and shop here more so our hope is as long as i can get all this stuff uh, squared away with the county with permits that sometime in the not too distant future we'll be able to transition from our current farm stand out to here mm -hmm. and we're going to have uh it'll be more like a store setting and we'll yeah. be able to uh pull in items from other farms and things like that some some of our friends that grow things that we don't and yeah that will allow us to grow less of the things that aren't quite as profitable and we'll be able to put more things in the ground here locally to just try to maximize our profit margins. So this has been an ongoing thing. We've been hit with every supply chain issue that you can imagine. Finding subcontractors on the island is, is always an issue. There's just not a lot of them out there. So yeah. we've done the best we could. We're here, we're almost done with it. We'll get there when we when we do. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about the prospects of it for sure. Yeah, that's great. So you have quite a bit of space where you're growing crops outside um not under tunnels what what crops do you how do you decide what what stuff goes under tunnels and what stuff goes outside we'll grow anything inside of a tunnel the big our big hoop houses the 30 by 95s mm -hmm. we'll grow whatever in them we try to keep the caterpillars for our higher value premium selling things like tomatoes and peppers the cucumbers the watermelons we use the caterpillars for those and we we try to only use the caterpillars during the late spring all summer and then into fall and then once the season is over with them we'll stop using the tunnels unless we need extra space to overwinter okay and then we'll use the big tunnels to for our overwintering stuff we'll put stuff in there that's sensitive to the wind or rain and we just want to protect them a little bit more and maybe make it a little bit warmer in there uh if we need to so we use them all, all the time, uh, but the ones that really make us the money are the caterpillar tunnels, because that's okay. where we have the high value stuff. And okay. uh, yeah, it, it was, it's, so far it's worked out for us. As far as the field crops, we're in the Northwest, we're able to grow, all of the brassica crops grow really well year round. Yeah. So kale, collards, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, all of those things grow really well here. This is all of it. This is our Brussels sprouts for the, for the fall. Um, they grow really well here, obviously, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll pick off of this stuff into the fall, and we'll have some carrots outside, beets, things that are a little bit more winter hardy. Lettuce out. and stuff. I, I know you have. Uh, is this all Salanova? It's not Salanova. It's this. It's the. It's like the one cut version that comes from Vitalis that high mowing at Osborne sell. Okay. That's generally what it is. But yeah, that's our salad mix that we do two colors. We do a 50-50 blend of red and green and it's by far our best selling item for sure. Okay, really? Yeah. And you, you're able to get good production of that outside, not under a tunnel? We, we'll, we will put some in late, I don't know, October. We'll put some in the tunnels Okay. to get us through Christmas time. The end of and year, yeah we our days are short in the winter we'll get below 10 hours of daylight i don't remember the the date but it's sometime in december mm -hmm. or whatever and uh so what zone want, are you in we're 8b 8b yeah. Okay. yeah so we don't get we don't get cold we don't get hot we're right on the puget sound the puget sound is always hovering around 50 degrees uh -huh. fahrenheit and so that means that we're a little bit warmer on land in the winter and a little bit cooler on land in the summer. Okay. And it's all because of the effect of the um, the wind blowing off of the water. So yeah. we have that moderating effect, which is good and bad. Yeah. You, when you guys bought this property, there was no infrastructure. So all of this you've built, what was the thought process that went into this barn that you've built here? We knew that we were gonna need a structure to be able to do well, everything. This is the yeah. heart of the operation. Yeah. And it's like a lot of places. Uh, 
you need something to house material, have a wash station. You know, we, we have a gym in here. Yeah. Uh, it's, we've got a wood shop in here. It's, it's, it's everything. And if we didn't have this, I don't know how we could function, but mm -hmm. the, if I'd have had the money at the time, I would have built it bigger, okay. but you, you work with what you have and it's, uh, we were in here every day, multiple times a day. You know, harvest days, this is our wash and pack station over here on the left. Mm -hmm. And then we've got some racks that's just storing pints and bags and clamshells. And we've got an office and a bathroom and a brick room and that little thing right here. And then everything that's been built here has been cut with these saws. And so we try to keep it separated a little bit just mm -hmm. to keep things clean and tidy. Uh, but yeah, this is everything for us. This was the first thing that we, we built and finished out here because we knew we were going to to need something like this uh, and it's been it's been a blessing to have for sure and we have I don't know what we do without it but yeah yeah that's great and you have like a lean-to on the side where you're able to store a tractor and a lot of your farm yeah. tools and then in here is more just like shop tools for like sure that. so the tractor lives on the other side of this wall right here half of the lean-to is that and then this is our walk-in cooler it's a it's about a 250 foot walk-in cooler we've got two cool bots in there and we store everything for our farm stand and then our market days. We put everything in coolers. Okay. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, we'll store flowers in here if we need to, winter squash, whatever we need to keep out of the elements. And yeah, having two units, two AC units, can, um, we can moderate the temperature and things like that. In the wintertime, if we need to keep it a little bit warmer, we mm -hmm. can with a quick adjustment. And yeah, it's well insulated, so it does what we need to do. Okay. So you build this with just this two inch um foam no there, it? It, there's there's a little bit of everything in there okay. uh, there's there's some rigid and some standard uh bat insulation in there okay. but there's a moisture barrier in between to keep everything separate okay uh again living on an island you you work with what you can get access okay. to when our local building supplier that's what they had so that's what we got okay i, I can't just run down the road to one of the big box warehouse Home stores. Depot or yeah. Something. Yeah. It's a little bit of a chore to do that. So, okay. but yeah, it's, it's worked out well for us and it serves, serves the, the needs that we have. Right? So it's 250 square foot and you have two cool bot units running to keep it cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a high, it, the ceilings are tall. So there's a lot of volume of air in there, yeah. but the two, two units seem to do uh, enough to keep the pace on a hot day. It does, yeah. uh, it does what we need it. One wouldn't be able to keep up with it. So when you take hot crops out of the field, it naturally wants to raise the temperature in there. So this does a good job fighting yeah. that off. Yeah. You probably made a really good choice building a big walk-in cooler because I've been on a lot of farms where they have little small ones yeah. and you won't regret going big. This is probably one of the bigger walk-in coolers that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, when we're pumping stuff out, it's head to toe, it, it's packed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're lucky to have it. We did have the first one we had was an eight by eight by eight. So okay, was, so this it, is the second iteration. It's the second iteration. Okay. We quickly figured out that that was not enough room. So then, yeah. then built this one, and yeah, this has served us well for a long time. And okay. we still have room to grow in here. But yeah, in the peak of the season, it'll it'll be like amazing. There, you can't hardly walk. But okay. Yeah. Cool. That's neat. I definitely have experienced the reality that no matter how big of a barn or shop that you build the the space gets used and you wish you'd built it bigger later on so for sure that's like one of those things that when you're making that investment you should um build as big as you can afford when you're starting yeah yeah and people you just you work with what you have and yeah you can make improvements along the way and not everybody has enough money up front to do everything they want to do for sure yeah yeah but you know at least you should build with growth in mind and i think that's one thing that you know when you're starting out you should think about okay when we use up this space how are we going to be able to reasonably and, and easily s expand um so yeah something to grow into right sure so 50 percent of the sales from the farm come from this little building which is amazing yeah we're super lucky and again it's it's credit to are very loyal customers who, yeah. Um, yeah, like I say, accepted us from the beginning. 
with open arms and have been nothing but supportive. So this was one of the first things we built before the house was even here. Me and a buddy and some, you know, a couple of people built this thing. And a lot of it is salvage material, uh, salvage windows, flooring that was on sale from somewhere or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. We, we restock it three times a day and sometimes that's not enough. Uh, we, we sell flowers out of it, obviously all the veggies and uh, we, we utilize the table. You sell transplants as well? Yeah, in the, in the springtime we have a big plant sale uh, in April, just before the farmer's market season starts. And we invite people to the farm and the big propagation house that we went in first, we had that whole thing set up from front to back with veggie starts, flower starts, strawberry starts, and we advertise it and do a weekend long plant sale and people come and it's a good way for us to get some early season income before the market starts yeah. and it sets us off on the right foot. Cause we don't do a CSA where we can, you know, get paid up front and things like yeah. that. So okay. that, that's a good way to get a, a nice cash infusion early in the season. But yeah, so we try to sell starts and veggies and flowers out of here. And we got a little bit of merchandise and yeah. everything. So yeah, it's 140 square feet. That's tiny. It, it's yeah, it's tiny. So yeah, we outgrew it a long time ago and that's the hopefully. And this is open seven days a week. Seven days a week from sun up to sundown. And this past year is the first year we've had it open every day. So okay. we had it, we even had it open on Christmas day. We had a few customers come through here. We are just like, well, we're here. So might as well open the doors. And yeah, we yeah. had some shoppers. So it's been open every single day. And that's not the easiest thing because we're, we're a small farm. So trying to keep it stocked with stuff is kind of a struggle and mm -hmm. we have good support or whatever. So making sure that we, we try to keep enough things in there to make it. So when people st stop to shop, they have enough variety and options in there right. to spend some money. So yeah. we don't want them to stop by and not buy anything if we can help that because they've made the effort to stop. So we want to be able to make it worth their while to do that. That's awesome. Cool. Well, it's been really neat to see your operation here. If people want to follow what you're doing, do they? Do you have social media accounts that they can follow? Yeah, the easiest way is probably Instagram. That's the one that I I keep up to date the most, and everything bounces over to my Facebook page. Okay. But it's it's Foxtail Farm Whidbey. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. That's the easiest way. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for having us yeah, over. Yeah, man. Thanks so much thanks for coming man. out. Yeah.